In this example problem, what we are going to do is explore using a carbon-13 NMR spectrum to determine which of the four structures here is reasonable, which of the four structures matches with the carbon-13 NMR data that we have. This is a practical application because oftentimes when solving NMR structures, what you will do is come up with some candidate structures and use the full set of NMR data to confirm or refute those hypothesized structures. So we could envision here that what we've done is perhaps uh, conducted some proton NMR analyses or mass spectrometry or IR spectroscopy, and we've come up with these four candidate compounds. And now we want to use the carbon-13 data in order to determine which of these actually matches our full set of data. And so we have here a hint to start off with that the experiment was conducted in CDCL3, it indicates here. That refers to deuterated chloroform, where the hydrogen that would normally be present in chloroform hydrogen 1 is instead replaced with deuterium hydrogen 2. And the advantage of that is that the deuterium is not NMR active. The deuterium does not have the necessary positive and negative spin states for it to be detected in an NMR uh, spectrometer. And so when the experiment is conducted in CDCL3, that prevents us from seeing a gigantic solvent signal. Instead, what we do see though is at 77 ppms, right here, we see a relatively small solvent signal. And what that is, is that represents the residual CHCl3 that was present in the solvent. So the solvent that is used, although it's listed as deuterated chloroform, in actuality, 1% or less of that is actually CHCl3. And so you end up in NMR with a residual peak generally for the solvent in which the experiment was conducted. And so we can ignore that signal. That signal we can use as a reference to make sure that our spectrum is lined up correctly, that that signal does indeed appear at 77 ppm, the theoretical expected value, but we don't need to pay attention to that um, signal otherwise beyond that. So in looking at and trying to sort out which of these structures, A through D, will fit with the data that we have, the first thing that we need to look at is the number of non-equivalent carbons meaning asymmetrically positioned carbons, needs to equal the number of signals that we see in the spectrum. Because we should see a signal in this nice, clear, clean carbon-13 NMR spectrum, we should see a peak for each individual carbon atom. Now keep in mind that unlike proton NMR, where the signals are split into those multiplets, with carbon NMR, the signals show up typically as singlets, as single individual peaks. So looking at the top part of this spectrum, what has been labeled for us are the chemical shift values of the different carbon atoms that are present. So these values up here represent our chemical shifts. And you can see a grand total of four chemical shifts listed here at 166.4, here at 83, corresponding down to this signal, and here at 27.9, as well as, in addition to being at 27.9, 27.8 as well, which we can circle that one too while we're at it. Now keep in mind that we also have an enlargement down here at the bottom of the screen where we've blown up that small region between 26 and 29 ppms so that we can better see the two signals that are closely clustered together there right around 27.8 to 27.9 so that we can tell that those are two signals present there. So we have a grand total of four signals showing up in our carbon NMR spectrum and so we need to make sure that each of these four structures actually have four non-equivalent asymmetrically positioned carbon atoms to represent these four signals in the spectrum. If it has 
fewer carbon atoms than that, that indicates that we are probably off track here. So in A, if we count up the number of non-equivalent carbon atoms, what we would see is there is symmetry in this molecule. There's a center of symmetry right here where I'm drawing the yellow dotted line. And so due to that symmetry, the carbon atoms that are present in this terbutyl group at this end that I'm highlighting in pink will show up at the exact same chemical shift as the ones that are on the right end of the molecule. So all of those carbon atoms that I'm dotting off in red and have highlighted in that pinkish red color will all show up as one signal because they are all in a completely identical indistinguishable chemical environment. They're all on freely rotating carbon-carbon single bonds and the molecule as a whole is symmetrical. So those are all symmetrically positioned around our yellow dotted line center of symmetry. So they all show up as a single signal. So that's just gonna give one signal in the NMR spectrum. Similarly, our quaternary carbon that I've dotted off in blue on the left half of the molecule and the right half of the molecule will also appear as a single signal because of the fact that we have symmetry going on between the two halves of the molecule. So that's a second signal. Then our third signal in the spectrum is going to be our carbonyl carbon right there that I've put a big green dot on. And that will give us our third signal. So this particular compound cannot possibly correspond to the carbon NMR data that we have collected here because this would only be expected to have three carbon-13 signals. And what we actually observe in our carbon-13 spectrum instead is four carbon-13 signals that we've circled in green there. So answer A is definitely a hard pass. That is definitely out. So I'm gonna put an X on that, that A is definitely not the structure. We can rule that out based on this carbon-13 experiment. So then we look at the others and evaluate kind of the same way, asking ourselves about whether they have the right number of carbon atoms to give the number of signals we observe. So here in structure B, I'm dotting off our methyl groups, the two terbutyl associated methyl groups, that would all show up as a single signal in the carbon-13 spectra, because again, there is symmetry in this molecule about the carbonyl group there. And so those would all show up as a single signal. Similarly, the quaternary carbon in blue would show up as a single signal, even though there's two of that carbon due to that symmetry. Coming onward through the molecule, we have a carbon atom here and here. Those are also symmetrical to each other, so they would show up as a single signal. And then finally, we get to the carbonyl carbon that would show up as an additional signal. So this particular structure, we would indeed expect to have a grand total of four signals in the carbon-13 spectrum. So this one remains on the table as a possibility. Similarly, we would see four signals possible for answer C here, here, here would all be one signal, all of those red dots because they are all symmetrically positioned around the central carbon, around this carbon there in the middle. And due to the free rotation around the carbon oxygen bond here, those can all interchange. And so they are all going to be in exactly the same chemical environment. Our quaternary carbon will show up as its own signal. The carbonyl here will show up as its own signal. And then finally, we have our methylene, our CH2 right there, bonded to the bromine that will show up as its own signal. So as we count this up, this would have a grand total of four carbon-13 signals. So this one remains on the table as well as a possibility. Finally, we come over to the next one. Got to keep symmetry in mind here. This one is another symmetrical option here. And in this symmetrical molecule, our carbonyl is going to give a signal. Then we come one spot over from the carbonyl on both sides, and we'd have a carbon there and there that are symmetrically positioned. So the two yellow dots would show up as one signal in our NMR spectrum. The four methyl groups that I'm dotting off in red right now 
would all show up as a single signal because those are all symmetrical relative to one another. They're all um, interchangeable due to the fact that there's free rotation around carbon-carbon bonds in this acyclic system. And then finally, we have our carbon CH2 group here and here, both bonded to bromine, both totally symmetrical in the molecule. So that will give us our fourth and final signal in the spectrum. So this would also have four carbon-13 signals. So by looking at the number of signals in the spectrum, we are able to rule out one of the four structures is all. We're able to rule out A. So we have to dig a bit deeper into this in our analysis as well. And we have to look at asking whether the chemical shifts are reasonable based on the functional groups that we see within the molecule. And in order to ask this, what we need to do is consult the table from our packet of information regarding NMR, those empirical data on carbon-13 chemical shifts to be specific. So we're going to consult the carbon-13 chemical shift chart in order to evaluate whether the chemical shifts are reasonable. Because we see different functional groups in these different molecules. In one case, we have a carbon bonded to a bromine um, and an ester. In this structure B, we have a ketone. In structure D, we have a ketone. So we can perhaps look at the chemical shifts and find that we have a chemical shift that will fit some of the functional groups better than others and eliminate some of these possibilities. So let's pull up that chart of carbon-13 spectral data. So what I've pulled up here and adjusted the size of the page a little bit for is our carbon-13 NMR chemical shift chart, which we see in the lower right-hand corner here. And what we can do is look at the distinctive functional groups in answers B, C, and D to determine whether there's any distinct signals that are present or missing from each of these. Now, as we look at this, one thing that sticks out to me about C versus B versus D in thinking about functional groups is that C has an ester, a carbonyl group directly bonded to an oxygen, whereas B and D have a ketone, a carbonyl directly bonded to a carbon in both of these cases, B and D. So as we look at the carbon-13 NMR chart here of expected values, something sticks out to me, which is that ketones are very far downfield. If we look at the ketone and we follow that beginning range, the most upfield range expected, is going to be somewhere around, it's looking to me like 180 or 190. I'll just put 185 to hit right in the middle there, ppms. And that's at the low end of the range. That's at the very upfield end of the range, further to the right in our spectrum. On the other hand, if we look at an ester, we see that the range of an ester following that down, is going to be a bit more upfield than that of a ketone. And the ester is going to show up somewhere between about, it looks like, 160, and we'll say something like 175, or 180, something, something around that region. And so, as we look then at our carbon-13 NMR spectrum, when we look at that region here, between 160 and further downfield, what we see is a signal at 166.4 and we see nothing further downfield. So considering that this is 166.4, the only thing that really will fit there is the ester group. The ketone we would expect to be further downfield. So keeping in mind that these S that the ketone groups in B and D we expect to be further downfield than the ester, that is suggesting to us that the ester, answer C, is what's represented in this carbon NMR spectrum. So again, answers B and D, the reason that we eliminated those is because the carbonyl of a ketone should be further downfield than 166, which is the most downfield signal that we see there is that 166.4 ppm signal.
So we can therefore eliminate answers B and D because the chemical shift of the, of the ketone functional group doesn't fit with the actual data that we have gathered here. And looking at answer C just to confirm that we are indeed correct in our assignment there, we can keep a couple of additional things in mind. So we had the right number of carbon-13 signals. We already determined that way back. And then assigning the identities of the different carbon-13 chemical shifts, we will go ahead and plug in green there at the carbonyl our 166.4. I'm going to go ahead and put a check mark on that up here in the spectrum to indicate that we have assigned that to someone so we don't try to assign it to another carbon atom. And then our 83.0, as we look at our spectrum of table of our expected values, what we see when we think about 83, that's going to be here roughly halfway between 50 and 100. So following up here, what we see is that a carbon directly bonded to an oxygen atom or a carbon directly bonded to the nitrogen atom in the nitro group or an alkyne down there at the bottom of the table are both are all going to be good fits for that. And so looking at our structure, it just so happens that this tertiary carbon atom in blue is directly bonded to an oxygen. So that's going to fit right here in our chart. I'm circling it there. And we are definitely right on point with 83.0 being a good fit for that position. Then our more shielded carbon atoms, these guys over here, are shielded because they are further away from the electron withdrawing oxygen atom. And those, we see two signals as possibilities for that, 27.9 and 27.8. 27.9 and 27.8 falling right around in here with my laser pointer. And one group that we see in that 27 region is saturated alkanes. And it just so happens that this tert-butyl group is indeed a saturated alkane. So we can ascribe that to the 27.9 or 27.8 signal. And I'm going to ascribe it to the 27.9 because you'll notice that signal is a lot larger than the 27.8, suggesting that it represents a larger number of carbon atoms. So this represents our signal at 27.9 is where we would expect to see those three methyl groups occurring. And then that leaves us with one remaining straggler here. That is the methylene group, the CH2 over here. And that CH2 group is going to be left at 27.8 by process of elimination. And at 27.8, as it turns out, that is right in the range where you would indeed expect to see a carbon directly bonded to a bromine. So that will take care of that. And everything seems to add up, check out, and make sense. And so with that, we will assign the answer to this problem as C. When you're looking through the bundle of practice problems related to this unit, you will see some additional practice on solving questions like this where you're given in kind of a multiple choice format, multiple structures, and you're asked, based on the data that you have, which of those structures is the correct one? And it's a very practically applicable skill as well, because in many cases you will use one type of NMR data to narrow down chemical structures, and then you will need to bring in another type of NMR data to conclude what the correct structure is and or refute some of the structures that are not going to work out as we piece together the puzzles of complete chemical structures.